the Korean War. What was your branch of service? Army Infantry. Your highest rank? Star Sergeant. Sergeant. Yes. This kind of starting from when you first enlisted, and just kind of go through just where you serve, different locations you went. All right, we started off at Fort Dix, New Jersey where I had eight weeks of basic training and eight weeks of advanced infantry training. From there, we were shipped to Fort Lewis, Washington. We, were, we waited for uh, a troop ship to arrive at Seattle to uh, take us to Korea. From there, we spent about a year. I spent about a year in Korea. And coming back, I served the remainder of my time at Fort Devons, Washington, and Fort Drum, New York. That was it. You were an ETS officer. Yes. Well, were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. Where were you living at the time that you enlisted? Right here on Edgewood Road in Kensington. Can you tell me a little bit about why did you enlist? Well, at that time, there were three of us that were ready to be drafted. And I said, well, maybe if I enlist, I'll get a better deal out of it. Well, I enlisted and the other two fellows were drafted. One of them spent two years in Maryland and the other one was sent to Europe to spend his two years. And lucky me, I got the sense of I got sent to Korea. Uh, it doesn't sound right. Now. It doesn't sound right enough to me either. Well, you say three of them. Who are you talking about? Well, I'd rather not mention their names. They were good buddies of mine. Oh, good friends. They weren't brothers. No, not my brothers, no. Well, why did you choose the Army and the Air Force? Well, uh, during World War II, I had three brothers and a sister in the Army, so it was kind of kind of a, a tradition that I go into the army and uh, be the same as my, you know, sibling. Can you just kind of tell me your experience with the first days of service, the surprises or the well, of course you're homesick, you know, and. Uh, we had some uh, real good cadre there. They were Korean War veterans, and and they knew uh, quite a bit about, you know, Korean tact. I mean, the infantry t tactics, about all the guns, the rifles, and the machine guns, the mortars. So we got a good basic training, very good, and we got to fire just about every weapon in the infantry. So. Uh, they were kind of hard on us, you know, like any uh, basic training company, but it was good for us, and uh, we learned a lot. And I think that when when we got to Korea, we were, you know, well trained. Not that we didn't learn a lot when we got to Korea. We learned a lot from the old timers when we got there, but we still had a basic uh, training as far as the weapons and some of the tactics involved. So it was a good it was a good 16 weeks. After basic training, you went straight from basic training to Korea? Yes. Fort Lewis. Fort Lewis, and then we got a, on a troop ship, USS Simon B. Buckner. And uh, I can remember that name very well. And from there, we went to Japan. We uh, got off the ship. They issued us a, an M1 rifle, took us out to the range. And the same day, we were back on another troop ship heading for uh, Pusan, Korea. From there, we were uh, kind of put into different groups, put on a train that didn't go very fast, maybe 10 miles an hour about the fastest, and it stopped just about every little town on the way. And it took us maybe a good half a day to get to Seoul. You want me to continue? And from there, 
we were put on, we were loaded onto trucks, and uh, I was on a truck that was headed for the uh, rear headquarters of Third Infantry Division. And when we got there, they unloaded us, and they uh, called our names out and so forth. And I can remember there were two soldiers that were heading the other way. They were they were sitting on the rock that was in that area, and and they kind of gave us a little a resin, kind of a resin, like in uh, telling us that we better uh, be aware that it wasn't that easy up there. So anyway, from there, they put us on uh, another truck. We went to regimental, regimental headquarters rear. And from there, we went to battalion. So I was with the... From the battalion, we went to company. I was with Fox Company, 15th Regiment, 3rd Infantry Division. I was in the 1st Platoon, 4th uh, Squad. My squad leader's name was Kelly, who had, uh, while I was there, maybe uh, three weeks after I got there, he earned the Silver Star. And he rotated in, uh, I think it was like May of 53. He was from Texas. He reminded me of Audie Murphy. He was, oh, he was a young old guy. Can I tell you a little story of what he did? At nighttime, <clears throat> yeah, Chinese used to put out a, a loudspeaker and they would play music for us. And the loudspeaker was out in front of their position and they had a trench line that ran from their positions out to this microphone or the loudspeaker and at one point in the trench line when the man went out to get to retrieve the loudspeaker you could see the top of his head as he ran out there so sergeant kelly he noticed that this day he said i'm gonna get that guy so just shortly probably an hour or so before they would take that loudspeaker and he set his machine gun set a machine gun up on top of the bunker and when he saw that fella going across there, he let go. But I, I doubt if he got him because you could only see pretty much the top of his head. But Sergeant Kelly, oh, he was a hero. Let me tell you, he was, he, he, he was, he was a fighter. Like I say, he reminded me of Audie Murphy. Yeah, and he was from Texas also, so uh, he must be some tough guys down there. So. Uh... Where were you at exactly? It was known as the Chorwan Valley. Chorwan, C-H-O-R-W-O-N, Chorwan Valley. And there was a little town of Chorwan, but there was nothing left to it. There was not one building standing. Everything was in ruins. And we were in an area that's called the Iron Triangle. And uh, there was uh, three outposts in that area. Some GI gave them the names of Tom, Dick, and Harry. Uh, and from there, we were also in another area called Kumwa. That was to the east of Chorwan. And, uh, we were pretty much in that area the, the full time that I was in Korea. And you remember how to spell Kumwa? K-U-H-M-A-U, I think, Kumwa, or W-U. But it's just to the right of, uh, to the, to the east of Chorwan. Uh, we were probably about 20, 30 miles, 20, about 20 miles north of the 38th parallel at that time. So, uh, that's where I spent just about one year in Korea. What was it made at the time? What was the point of the time? The time? Well, there was Outpost Terry. Uh, there was a city in a small town in North Korea. And then Kumwa was that them three areas. So they call that, I think the name of that town in, in North Korea is Ponyang or something like that. I think it was Ponyang. It was something in that, uh, in that, uh, well, whatever it was, it was in that triangle area. What were your activities there? Daily activities? Daily activities? We'll start. By uh, say, let's start at the evening. 
we would go on watch <clears throat> one hour before sundown. We'd be on watch completely until one hour after sunup. It was 100% alert at all times. There was no one man awake and one man sleeping. It was 100% all the time when we were on watch. What would happen would we'd have to have one man awake during the daytime, at least one man per squad awake. So what I would do is I would send one of my men to the sleeping bunker approximately three in the morning to get an early sleep. The other men would probably get off watch about seven in the morning, depending on the time of the year. But it was about seven in, in April, May, June, July. And we'd go, they'd go to sleep. I would stay up until about 10. And then that fellow that I spent to sleep early would get up and he would be on watch until the rest of the fellows got up. And about two o'clock, we'd all be, uh, awake and we'd, we'd have our sea rations. The sea rations were consisted of a box of food. It was one can of your, your main meal. You had a choice of getting, you didn't have a choice, but you had a chance of getting one of three meals. It was either corned beef hash, sausage patty, or franks and beans. That was the main three. You never varied from that. And <clears throat> also, there was a, a, a little package of crackers. There was some, a little package of coffee, a little powdered milk and sugar a napkin, and I believe six cigarettes. And that was, and, and, uh, and, and a little can of sterno. So we would, about two, three o'clock, we would, squad would kind of get together, not all of them, but some of the guys, and some guys had friends in different squads. So we would, we would go and we would heat up our lunch and have our lunch and clean our weapons and, and then just hang around until it was time to go on watch again. I just want to uh, tell you about that corned beef hash. I don't know. <clears throat> I guess a lot of people like corned beef hash, but the stuff they had in them cans was not good. And we uh, used to fool them Korean boys that were attached with the katusas, and we'd say, changey, changey. Well, they didn't know right away what we were changing, but every time we changed with them, they were getting this corned beef hash. After three days, <laughs> there was no more changing, changing. They, 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 uh, they didn't like that corned beef hash either. So that was pretty much, uh, uh, what was going on. There usually was mortar artillery rounds coming in, but periodically throughout the day and night. Uh, it might be, uh, you, you could hear the artillery coming in. It whistled the, out in front of you coming toward you and you would kind of make yourself as small as possible. The mortar, you couldn't hear that coming in. That had no whistle to it. And uh, when that round dropped, there was no defense against it because uh, if you were in the wrong place, you were uh, not too lucky. So, uh, and also when the artillery was going out towards the other way, towards the Chinese, you could hear that going over your head. Also, so we were happy to hear it coming from our back going to the front. So that's pretty much, uh, we get mail probably maybe once a week, I guess. And, and then we could send our letters back. But other than that, there was not a lot going on. We didn't have to do any, any trench digging or anything like that. That was already done. The, bun the bunkers were made. We were already built, uh, and, uh, all the, uh, concertina wire and all of that was in place. And they also, out in front of our positions, they had these 50 gallon drums of napalm. They had a explosive that was attached to it and a trip wire that ran along in front of our position. So when the enemy came and they tripped that wire, this napalm would explode and then it would cover a good area with this jelly gas. And, uh, that, that was a good defense. Uh, when them, when that napalm hits your body, 
you can't wipe it off because if you wipe it off, it just spreads more. So uh, that was a very good defense, and they had they had that. I don't know how much they had, but there was some of that all around this this outpost or around the, the trench lines. So the whole time you were in Korea, the it was in the Iron Triangle area, yes. Well, when I first got there, we were, our our company was occupying Outpost Harry, and I was there probably, I guess, three weeks, maybe three weeks, and on the night of the twenty fourth of April, we were we were what I what I found out not too long ago there was. Eight of us on the hill on that outpost, two platoons, and we were attacked by an estimated thousand to twelve hundred Chinese at precisely eleven o'clock that night. I can remember being on the on the machine gun at that time. Our squad leader was Sergeant Kelly, and uh, he would he would take the machine guns out of the bunkers and put them on top of the bunkers. Because of the fact that he had a much better field of fire, and if the Chinese had overrun the hill in areas, we could swing around and fire to the back of us. So we were on top of the bunker, and our uh, assignment was to call into headquarters every hour. We had to call into headquarters, make sure that we were awake and we were on duty. So. At 11 o'clock that night, or just before 11 o'clock that night, it was my turn to go down into the bunker and call into headquarters. And as I was calling, I know Sergeant Kelly answered, and I could check it in. And just at that time, I was checking in. All this artillery and mortars came in. And within a 10 seconds, I heard Sergeant Kelly yell out, not on the phone, but yell out. He said, he said, they're in the trenches already. So they had, they had gotten there quite fast. They were in the trenches. I went back outside to go back up on the bunker and I looked over the trench line and there were, the enemy was coming up, quite a few of them. So I took my carbine and I fired off up to the top of the trench line. I never made it back up to the Top of the bunker because I was busy at the position at the entrance of the bunker. There was a box of grenades there. I don't know how many, but at the end of the night, there were none left. I, I used them all and come to find out a round had hit my buddy up on top of the bunker and he was killed. The machine one was was a few uh, yards away, so lucky for me, I didn't make it back up on top of the bunker. Uh, later on in the night, <clears throat> uh, when the Chinese had gotten control of the upper half of the front, the front half of the outpost, uh, the men gathered down in an area close to where I was, and they called me over and it was there, uh, Lieutenant Baker, who was one of the platoon leaders, and Lieutenant Mitchell, who was our executive officer. They were the two officers that were there at the time. My platoon leader, Lieutenant Whittemore, he was killed earlier that night. And, uh, Lieutenant Baker, who was, uh, kind of not in charge because he was only a second lieutenant, but Lieutenant Mitchell, he was, Kind of badly wounded, and they were they were mapping out a counter a counter attack. And Lieutenant Baker mentioned that he would go up on one side of the trench line because there was a loop, and we were down at the bottom of the loop. And and Lieutenant Mitchell says, "Well, I'll go up on the other side." And I can remember Lieutenant Baker saying, "No, you're not, Lieutenant." He says, "Medic," he says, "Take care of him." And I looked over at Lieutenant. Mitchell and he had blood coming from covering his face and his sleeves on his sleeves were rolled up 
and he had blood on both his arms. So from there, Sergeant Kelly would lead a group on one side, and Lieutenant Baker would get a group on the other side. We advanced up, and I think it took us maybe an hour, and we cleaned out the top of the hill. And at the end of the night, in the early morning rather, uh, we started carrying off our wounded. We had to cure a hill. We had a replacement by another company. There was platoon, a couple of platoons coming up, but we were taking off the wounded. And I can remember uh, this one fella, he was a good friend of mine, Corporal Lockhart. We called him Lockhart. Everybody called each other by their last name. His name was Corporal Lockhart, and he was in the bunker. And what happened to him, poor fella, when the Chinese came, he went to throw a grenade out there aperture in the bunker and he missed and the grenade exploded in, inside the bunker but he was still alive and we put him on a stretcher and we're heading down the hill and i didn't get down i don't think maybe halfway down the trench line when two fellas coming up that were i believe medics and i was in the back of the stretcher and another fellow was in the front of the stretcher and as i uh as we met these two fellows coming up the hill, like I say, I, I thought they were medics and, and they were still, you know, their clothes were kind of clean, so they weren't up on the hill. So one of the fellows grabbed the, the front, the front of the stretcher from the other fella, and the other one was going to grab my end, and I says, oh no, I says, I'm good here. He says, no, no, he says, I'm taking that. He says, I ain't going up there, he says. So anyways, uh, we continued, uh, we continued uh, taking off the wounded, and that morning we were re relieved and we went back. Uh, at the, uh, a day or so later, can you hear that Ethan? A, a, a couple days later, while we were re receiving replacements because of all the, well, let me finish. Uh, of the 88 men that were uh, on the hill that night, we had 72 casualties, 19 killed, and they estimated we killed between two and 300 of the enemy. Uh, a couple of days later, the company commander, while we were back in reserve, he asked all the old timers, the ones that were there for a while, to uh, assemble at the headquarters tent there at one o'clock. I really didn't know what it was about, but there was only a few of us anyway. There was probably 20, maybe 15 or 20 of us, maybe not even that. Some of them were walking wounded anyway. We were going to go to an area not from far from there, and we were having a ceremony. And nobody knew what it was about. So anyway, he led us up in a column of twos up the sheer cart path and uh, it was just a cart path, that's all it was. And as we reached the top of this little knoll, there was a Greek band out in an open field. And as they saw us coming, they opened up playing Colonel Bogey's March. And we marched down that hill. The company commander called Caden and we marched into that hill, into that field. And there they presented Lieutenant Baker with a distinguished service cross. We were so proud that one of our men that we fought alongside received that high honor. And I'll never forget that day. And uh, like I say, uh, my squad leader, also was decorated. He received the, uh, the Silver Star. And later on, <clears throat> in my stay in Korea, they recommended me for the Bronze Star, which I received later on. Well, I can tell you a few stories about different happenings. 
Uh, we were on, uh, I say there was these three outposts, Tom, Dick, and Harry. I never got to serve on outpost uh, Dick, but I did serve on Tom and Harry. And uh, Tom was out in the middle of a, a big, big valley that's called the Chorwan Valley. To get out there, they put us on a half track. And they didn't start the engines until we were all ready to go because they had like three different roads to go out there. And they knew the Chinese had all them roads pretty much zeroed in. So when they heard that half track start up, they probably would activate their mortar squads and, and give us a little shelling. But the night we went out, there was no, uh, nothing happened. We got out there and, uh, Actually, there was no action whatsoever the time that I sent, stayed out there. We, we stayed out there maybe two or three weeks, and there was nothing going on. We used to run out patrols, uh, different areas. I could tell you some stories there, but maybe we tell some other stories. Uh, we ran out patrols at night, but we never we never had any probing of our lines or anything like that. We, just the same, you know, you're on watch, 100% watch. There was a saying in our outfit. It went like this. Where fear enters your heart at dusk, with dawn comes exhaustion. When you were done with your watch that night, you were exhausted. You didn't do a, one little bit of strenuous work at all. All you did was stand there and look out and and watch and listen and i can remember the first day i got to, on the outpost uh, harry sergeant kelly came to me and he, and he says listen he says you're going to hear some noises down there at night he says be careful he says what was happening was when the gis ate their sea ration they would throw their cans down the hill and then there were rats down there they would be going through the the cans is finding something to eat. So he says, be sure before you fire that you know there's something down there. And you could hear them and they would be, you know, dingle dingle and and uh you know pretty much after a while that with the sound of the rats going through the can. So uh from there we were <clears throat> we were sent back on line. This was to the west of outpost Perry, between outpost Perry and outpost Dick on the main line. And I can remember uh, when we got there, we replaced another company and it was in, it was in May, early May. And uh, as we got into our position, it was early afternoon or mid afternoon and the Chinese loudspeaker started again. And they said, welcome fax company. Glad to see you. Be alert. We'll be over to see you some night. And then they play us some music. They play us some American music. And I can also remember maybe two days later was a Sunday afternoon. Beautiful day, sunshine, warm. And they started in again. They started playing a little music. And then the voice of this American voice, young lady, she said, what are you boys doing over here? This is not your war. Your buddies are back home. They're with their tops down, riding around with the tops down with your girls. And then they played cruising down the river on a Sunday afternoon. <laughs> so that was kind of, you know, depressing, but exactly, psychological. And I can remember the the first time online that we were going to get a hot meal. We were going to get a chicken dinner. And it was a, a nice day again. It was another Sunday. We had, we had mass for us down at the bottom, the back of the hill. And, uh, it was on the, the altar was on the top of the Jeep hood. That was the altar for the, for the mass. And that day we were going to get a, a chicken dinner. So we were going to go down. A half a squad at a time. Four or five guys go down, four guys, five guys stay back. 
Well, the first bunch that went down, they got maybe within 30, 40 yards of the mess of people. And sure enough, mortar rounds came in. That was the end of our chicken dinner. The cooks picked up their stuff and the way they went and we had, we had our tea rations again. Uh, let me tell you a few other stories. When we were online, we had what they call a listening post. This was an area out in front of the main line between our lines and the enemy's lines. And you would go out, two people, two soldiers would go out, spend the night out there. They would take a radio with them and they would have to call in every hour again to headquarters to make sure they weren't sleeping out there. And you would call in if you saw any activity out into this valley. And if there was a, like a, an enemy patrol going through, you would, you would, uh, call in and tell them their location, you know, as to where you were situated, as to where they were. And they would send out some mortar and artillery rounds and, and, uh, kind of break that up. So that was, uh, kind of a scary idea, a scary situation. Two guys out into this one area that was halfway between your lines and their lines. And, uh, at least, uh, after, after your, your, your day, your night was done, you didn't get that assignment maybe for another three, four weeks. So it wasn't that bad. But, uh, I can remember this one night when, uh, <clears throat> in the middle of the night, there was gunfire out near where the listening post was. And I happened to be up by my number one gun and our lieutenant, our, our platoon leader, he ordered me and another one of the ammo bearers, this fellow Yum Dong Han, to go out and Bring that, bring that, uh, listening post squad back in. So we went out and we set up a little bit of a base of fire. We went over to them and, uh, we ordered them to come back in and, uh, we got them back in safely. What had happened was this. One of the fellows that went out onto the listening post that night, he was on his second tour to Korea. And he admitted that he wanted to earn the Medal of Honor. And he started firing on his Chinese patrol. Well, when he got back in, he no longer was with the infantry. He was transferred to the rear someplace. So that was one of the incidents. Uh, maybe I can tell you about my good Korean buddy. We had, we had three Korean two or three, sometimes two, sometimes three Korean young soldiers attached to our our squad. So every nine men in a squad, there would be two or three Koreans. They call them Katusas. Katusas mean K-A-T-U-S-A, Korean attached to the United States Army. K-A-T-U-S-A, United States Army. Well, these fellas, they were good soldiers. They were alert and they were they would do anything you tell them. They would be on watch. They'd go out and patrol with you, whatever you wanted. And, uh, this one night, <clears throat> I was checking the two guns and, uh, about every hour I would go from one gun to another gun. And in between there would be different, uh, gun positions, uh, rifle positions. Well, it was a, a rainy night and I had my poncho on and as I re, I was, re, uh, approaching, as I was approaching, uh, our, our machine gun, our other machine gun position, I got an order to halt, and it was my good buddy Yum Dong. And while he, uh, gave me the order to halt, I heard this little click. And if you were in the, in the infantry, you know that little click was, uh, the safety going off on your M1 rifle. And he was ready. But then I, I gave him the password and I, I gave him his name and he was all right, but he was, he was ready for me. Uh, I don't know how much more you want me to tell you. Well, where, why did you have the Katusas with the Well, we had the Katusas with, with our, 
of it was because the Korean army, whenever the Chinese would attack in great numbers, they would what would pull back and they would they would what was called bug out. They would take off to the rear. They would not fight. So when they were attached to the Americans, they knew they had to fight or else they might get shot if they took off. So they were good soldiers. God, they were alert. They were helpful. They would do anything you asked them. They would stay at the gun or whatever you asked them, they would do it. So uh, we had no problems whatsoever them ever bugging out. Not when they were with us. No. Well, we uh, we all got pretty much the United Nations defense, the Korean uh, National Korean Medal with two uh, battle stars, uh, United Nations. Uh, Combat Infantryman's Badge. Combat Infantryman's Badge. To warn that every combat infantryman is their, not their goal, but boy, this is one thing you want to, you would want to get if you're a combat infantryman. To earn the com combat infantryman, which is widely known as the CIB, you would have to be 30 days on the front lines or engage in an eight hour firefight. So that, uh, I was, Awarded the Combat Infantry Men's Badge, United Nations Korean Service, National Defense, and the Bronze Star Medal. The Bronze Star was awarded to the I'm Outpost Perry. You do, uh, I do belong to an organization called the Outpost Perry Survivors Association. The group of men that fought on Outpost Perry in April and in, in June of 1953. In June, there was uh, six out of seven days that the Chinese uh, attacked that outpost, and it was at one time King Company had 95% casualties. So they were uh, they were probably the hardest hit. Uh, a sergeant from King Company was awarded the Medal of Honor. Sergeant Mize, he was awarded the Medal of Honor. Uh, and each night there was a different company on that outpost. And each night they throw some severe, severe fighting on that outfit. Uh, because it was pretty much the biggest hill from, uh, from there to Seoul. And they had a good view of many of our roads that led to the rear or from the rear to the front. And I can tell you a little story about even when they didn't, uh, they didn't capture the outpost carry from from their other hills they they had observation of several roads and i can tell you an experience this one time we went to the <clears throat> we hadn't had a shower in 27 days and we came offline and they put us in a one of these one ton trucks it was a it was like a pickup truck only an oversized pickup truck and uh, we got in as many as we could. There was three, uh, two plus the driver in the front, plus there was maybe, I don't know, 10 or 12 of us in the back. And we went back to a, a shower area. It was a crossroad. There was four roads there. It was on the Injim River. And as we approached the uh, crossroads, there was MPs directing traffic. And one MP came over to our driver as we stopped there at the crossroads. And he said to him, he said, I'm going to have to cite you for overloading. You were overloaded. Well, our platoon sergeant at the time, Sergeant Brokaw, he got out of the, he got out of the front of the truck. He went over to the MP and he grabbed him by his shirt and he lifted him up. And he says, listen, he says, I ain't going to tell you exactly what he said, but he said, these men ain't had a shower in almost a month, he says. And you're going to tell us you're going to cite this driver for taking these men down? He says, get out of here. And then he kind of shoved them and uh, we proceeded uh, 
to the area where we parked the Jeep, or the, the not the Jeep, the one-ton truck. And here's what the showers consisted of. It was uh, in April, and the Indian River, I guess, was just still a little life in there, in some areas. They would pump the water from the river into the showers. It would drain back down, right back into the river. There was no heating of the water whatsoever. So when you got to the showers, you got in there fast, you got out, you soaked up good, you got back in for maybe 30 seconds, and that was it. And they gave us a, a clean set of clothes, but uh, boy, uh, you were refreshed. And this was in April, end of April. And then on the way back, I was telling you about this road being zeroed in. I was coming down the road, and right in front of us, there was a sharp right turn on the road. And just before we were to make the right turn, a Jeep came barreling right by us. And the driver yelled out, he said, they're shelling the road, they're shelling the road. And our driver, he couldn't stop because we were going maybe 15, 20 miles an hour. So instead of turning to the right, he went off into this field. And it was bumpity, bumpity, bump. It was common wire all over the place. I can remember one fella, one, of the, one piece of the common wire caught onto the site on his M1. And it was like a... a I took the rifle and shot it off to the rear, to, to the rear of the the truck there, and there were plenty of rifles anyway. There was no shortage of rifles. So, anyways, we stayed out in that valley for a little while, and we turned around and we got back to our unit without incident. But uh, that was one of the incidents. Uh, are we close? How did you stay in touch with your family while you were here? Just by writing. Letters, letters I'd send, uh, I'd write probably once every week or a week and a half, two weeks. Then when I went to Japan on R&R, &R, I, uh, I called my folks. Well, my mother, my dad was passed away and I called my mom with very poor connection, but we got through and I talked to my mom and told her I was fine and everything. And I can remember how much that phone call cost me. It was $35 to call from uh, Kokura, Japan to my mom's house. 53. $35. Yeah, that took about a quarter of my monthly pay. Well, you know, you mentioned that you well, I can tell you a few, uh, another little story about after the war was over. We had some city kids that were in, in our squads. You know them city kids, they're street smart. These guys were street smart, let me tell you. I had this one kid in my squad. I won't mention his name, but he was from Pittsburgh. And he was slick. And usually in the evening or on weekends, there would be card games and crap games. And this one night, it was during the summer of 53, after the war was over, I was, I was just hanging around and I noticed a bunch of guys up, a few tents up. They had a big crap game going. And they had the tent rolled up on the side. And they were shooting crap on the, on the bed. It was a blanket there. And, and I approached there and I was, you know, just watching. And there was this one fellow was in my squad, like I say, the real city kid. And I said to him, I said, Lonzo, how you doing? And he said to me, he said, watch me, watch me. So I watched him very closely. So it came his time to shoot the dice. And he shot the dice. And this time he made his point. So as he grabbed the dice, he grabbed the money most of the money that he had laid down to bet, and he went to put it in his left hand where he had some other money. And as he was putting that money in there, I saw, I saw him change the dice. And he had some loaded dice in his hand. Then he rolled the dice, and he's seven, seven, eleven, seven. Then he take the money, and he changed the dice back again. And then he, he would, uh, and if they caught him, I think they'd have killed him. But, uh, 
that's what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, street kids. They, uh, they, uh, they've been around them guys. And I'm here in the country. I would have, I would have never thought anything of it, you know. But that's some of the people you run into. You run into, but he was a nice guy. Just that he was, he was short. No, we never got to see any of them. No, they, I remember one time they, they had, I don't know who it was over there and they, they asked, not asked, but they got two of the men from our company were allowed to go, but I wasn't one of them. No, but that was, we never had any USO shows. We had no entertainment whatsoever, no movies, no baseball, bats, anything like that. We just hung around, played cards, stuff like that. And, uh, Really wasn't too much going on. That's it. No, I should have. I really should have, but I never did. Yeah, it would have been very interesting even now to read it myself, you know. I never did. Wish I had. So, Bob, where were you when you started the campus? I was at Camp Drum in, uh, Fort Drum, New York. I mean, uh, Fort Devens, New York. For drum, we went for one summer. Uh, we trained the National Guard there. And, so you're in Fort now. Yeah, that was our home base, 74th Regimental Combat Team. We did a lot of training. Actually, the infantry is very boring if there's not a war going on. You go through the same training time after time. You start from first aid, rifles, all the way through it. And when you're done with that, but we did have a good experience where we we did an amphibious landing. We went, <clears throat> we went on a boat in Boston, Mass, and we sailed to Norfolk, Virginia, and we made a landing there, amphibious landing. And, uh, that was very interesting, very different. So that was something that, you know, that it wasn't combat or anything, but it was, it was, uh, you know, simulated. So it was interesting. That was it very was, yes. But like I say, Infantry is, you're out and doing maneuvers and then you're in and you're doing classes and it's, it's very monotonous. Repetition. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Um, so, then you got out coming home, you remember that day? Very well, oh yes. Come home and, uh, back with my family and everything and it was great, uh, I went back a few times to see my old buddies up there, uh, after I got out. And I made some good friends. And, uh, we still, uh, we still have a reunion. Outpost Harry Survivors. Every year we have a reunion in different, uh, parts of the country. This past year, in June, we had a reunion in Washington, D.C., being that it was the 50th anniversary of the ending, ending of the Korean War. So we had a reunion there. We've been, all over the country, California, Iowa, Boston, Mass, down in Florida, and Florida, and, and Georgia, Fort Benning, Georgia. We've been there a couple of times because that is, that was the home of the third infantry division there. So we've been there a few times and we've been quite a, quite a few places in Chicago and quite a few places. Very interesting. So after your service, did you, uh, after service, I uh, <clears throat> I hung around for a little while. I got a job in a factory in New Britain, and I was drilling holes in a block of aluminum, and it was so monotonous. Wow! I start at seven o'clock, and they usually had a break about nine thirty, and. Uh, when I would thought it would be time for a break, I looked at the clock and it was probably 20 after 7. <laughs> so I lasted there a week and I, I couldn't take it. I, it was just, time just dragged on and I, I wasn't happy. And while I got out of there, maybe uh, three, four days later, my brother's buddy who lived in Meriden, his father was a building contractor. And this was in November. And he asked me, he said, would you be willing to give me a hand framing a few houses, he said, so that we could have some work for the winter? I said, sure, why not? 
Well, I went to work for him, and I stayed there for like two years. And then I uh, I switched jobs, and I worked for a contractor in Berlin for another year and a half, two years. And then I started my own business. And <clears throat> I, uh, I've been in, I was in business in 19, I think 1962. I remember the first house I built on speculation. It was a five room ranch, two car garage, a nice lot, bath and a half, and it sold for 21,500. And today I imagine it can go for 270,000 maybe. But that was, everything is relevant anyway. People used to work for $4 an hour and even less. I was, I was going to work for the telephone company before I started with this guy. And, uh, they accepted me. I took a test. They accepted me, but the starting wage was $2 an hour. And I said, wow, that's not. What I was expecting, so I didn't go to work for the phone company. Uh, I just want to note that uh, while I was building houses, I had a development, and I had a street, and I didn't have a name for it. So I thought about it for a while, and I said I'd name it O'Connell Drive. I named it after a buddy of mine that I went to school with. He was the only soldier from Berlin that lost his life in the Korean War. And he, he lost his life, I believe it was on June, July, June uh, 11th or 12th in 1953. And he was on Port Chop Hill. And, uh, I named, uh, I named the street after him. Tommy O'Connell, his name was. God bless you, Tommy. The street's still, still there. Oh, yes. It's still there, and there's some fine houses on there. Have you had any, besides the meeting, the big story, have you had any contact with any of your fellows that you served with? Pretty much only at the, at the reunions. Once in a while, I call this fellow from Michigan who was a good friend of mine in Korea, and we, we talked for a while, and, and that's pretty much it. Uh, we now belong to the VFW. We have a lot of uh, Korean, not, not not a lot. We only have a few Korean vet, veterans there. There are a lot of World War II veterans, and we have now a lot of uh, Vietnam veterans, and some from the Gulf War and Iraq and Afghanistan. Well, I can tell you a few more stories, but I think I told you pretty much, you're not, not everything, uh, a lot of other going on. Uh, uh, yeah, I did experience a lot, and I, like I, I told you earlier, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it again for a million dollars, but I, I wouldn't sell my memories for a million dollars either. All right, well, thank you, and I want to thank you for your service. Thank you for this opportunity.